On Tuesday afternoon, November 12, 2002, a chilly autumn day in the Charminster district of the coastal British city of Bournemouth, some 105 miles southwest of London, two young children came home from school to a house of carnage neither would ever forget. Terry, then 14, and Caitlin, then 11, seemed to know right away that something was wrong entering the ground floor flat of Capstone Road where they lived with their mother, Heather Barnett, 48. After calling out for her and seeing strange footprints on the front room floor, they soon found their mother, lying dead in the bathroom. There was much blood, and they could see that someone had literally committed an act of savage butchery. Reeling with fright and revulsion at the sight of their mother's body in a pool of blood, the children quickly sought help by summoning the local police. Members of the police of Dorset County soon arrived, followed shortly by a team of detectives and forensic experts headed by Detective Superintendent Phil James and Detective Superintendent Mark Cooper. Even for seasoned detectives such as these, the crime scene was difficult to take in due to the brutality of the murder. After placing the frightened and distraught children in a safe environment, the detectives and their team of 50 officers worked throughout the afternoon and into the evening in an effort to make some sense out of what had occurred at the flat earlier in the day. The bathroom where Heather's body lay was a harrowing sight. It appeared to the detectives and their team that she had been struck over the head with a hammer-like object, and she had been stabbed several times. Her breasts had been removed, likely with a scalpel or similar sharp instrument, and had been placed next to her body. There was a lock of hair, roughly three inches in length, in her right hand. It might initially have been assumed to have come from her killer, possibly pulled out as she struggled for her life, but investigators could see that it did not appear to have been tightly clinched in her hand. Rather, it looked like it had been placed in her hand after her death. The investigators also noted the presence of a trail of bloody footprints that led into the middle of the front room, but then abruptly stopped. The footprints appeared to have been made by running shoes, and investigators speculated that the killer may have changed clothes at that location, perhaps to avoid leaving a trail of blood in the street. Knowing that the mysterious lock of hair found in Heather's hand would likely shed considerable light on the murder probe, James and Cooper wasted no time initiating its examination by forensic experts. We're very keen to speak to the person that this cut hair belongs to, because they could be a significant witness, Cooper said later when news of the clue had become public. The importance accorded this hair would lead some in the media to refer to the case as the hair in hand murder. DNA examination of the lock of hair soon confirmed the investigators' initial belief that it did not belong to Heather. Police also seriously doubted that the lock of hair belonged to Heather's killer. A number of women in the Bournemouth area would later report that their hair had been cut under suspicious circumstances, including while traveling on buses. Heather was described as having been feisty and independent by a relative, a hard-working woman who would do anything for anyone that needed help. Everyone who knew her had difficulty believing that she had met such a violent end. Heather Barnett, a seamstress who grew up in the nearby Dorset village of Sturminster Newton and was known by her friends as Bunny, was last seen alive early that Tuesday morning when she had dropped Terry and Caitlin off at school. Due to a number of factors, including the condition of the blood at the crime scene, James and Cooper believed that Heather had been killed sometime during the following morning hours. As officers fanned out through the neighborhood in search of clues, and, with luck, someone who might have seen someone suspicious in the area on the day of the murder, they found one neighbor who had a video security camera aimed at the street. They hoped that the camera had captured the image of the man on video as he fled Heather's home and appealed to others in the neighborhood with video security cameras on their property to come forward with video images captured on the day of Heather's murder. Residents are urged to come forward if they remember anything relevant to the inquiry especially anyone outside her house on the day she was killed, Detective Superintendent James said. James and Cooper also asked area residents to inspect their garages and tool sheds to determine whether anything such as a hammer and a knife might be missing. At this point, they were grasping for anything they could that might provide a clue to help them solve the brutal case. This is an unusual murder case, Cooper said. It continues to be a challenge, and as always, the help of the public is vital. As it turned out, the image of a man was, in fact, captured by a closed-circuit television camera. 
a man was walking past Richmond Arms Pub on Charminster Road, not far from Heather Barnett's residence at 9.30 a.m. on the day of the murder. Although the man was not immediately identified, the lead was considered potentially significant. At one point in the investigation, detectives tentatively identified the footprints made in blood as having come from a Nike brand training or running shoe. Detectives traveled more than 5,000 miles to Nike headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon, a suburb of Portland, in an effort to identify the shoe, which turned out to be the Nike Terra trainer. Aside from learning more about the distinctive shoe pattern, little was learned during the long trip to the Pacific Northwest, but the investigators remained hopeful that they would eventually be able to identify the owner of the shoe. During their inquiries with Heather's neighbors, detectives questioned a 30-something Italian national, Danilo Restivo, who resided in a flat opposite Heather's on Capstone Road. Lacking evidence at the time to do anything other than question him as a person of interest in the case, the Dorset detectives could not hold Restivo beyond a few hours. Nonetheless, Restivo would remain in their sights throughout the investigation, as will be seen. As the case moved forward with few results, Restivo would be arrested and questioned again in 2004, but due to lack of evidence, he was again released without charge. As the investigation continued, the police told members of Heather's family that whoever had committed the brutal murder had planned it and was aware of the forensic aspects of a homicide investigation. As a result, the killer had left very little forensic evidence at the scene that could be used to link him to the crime. As time moved forward to 2006 without any significant clues to lead to Heather Barnett's killer, and with Restivo still at the top of their list of suspects for reasons about which investigators will not yet talk, detectives turned to Reading University's Dr. Stuart Black, whose specialty is the forensic analysis of human remains. Using stable isotope analysis, which has revolutionized the science of criminal forensics, on the strands of hair found in Heather's hand, Dr. Black and his colleagues were able to work up a significant profile of the person to whom the hair strands had belonged. According to Dr. Black, he and his team were able to determine that the strands of hair represented nine months' growth and belonged to a person who lived in the United Kingdom. The person, however, had traveled abroad on two occasions and had changed their diet twice in the three months prior to the hair being cut. According to the Dorset Police document, the person in question had traveled to the Valencia to Almeria area of eastern Spain and or the Marseille to Perpignan area of southern France for up to six days, approximately 11 weeks before the strands were cut. Afterward, the person visited an urban area of Tampa, Florida for eight days, approximately two to two and a half weeks before the hair was cut. Armed with the new information, the Dorset Police Major Crime Investigation Team again appealed to the public for assistance this time asking that anyone with knowledge of a person traveling to the aforementioned locales prior to Tuesday, November 12, 2002, the day of Heather's murder, to contact detectives. The results of the analysis on the hair are a very exciting and very significant development, Cooper told reporters. We are pursuing a number of lines of inquiry and all possibilities are being investigated. Two years later, in 2008, police decided that a collaborative effort with their counterparts in Italy might be in order. Restivo was, after all, from Italy. Dorset detectives eventually revealed that they had learned early on in the investigation that Restivo had also been looked at as a person of interest by police in Italy in the disappearance of a 16-year-old schoolgirl, Elisa Claps of Potenza, a city in the southern part of Italy. Restivo had been one of the last persons to see her alive on September 12, 1993, a Sunday after she left home wearing a sweater knitted by her mother to meet with them in a 15th century church in Potenza. If she had met with foul play at Restivo's hands, a collaborative effort might yield results. It was something of a long shot since the girl's disappearance had no apparent direct connection to Heather's murder. But with little to lose, the Dorset detectives provided information about their case to Italian authorities, who, in turn, broadcasted on a program on state-run television called Ci Ia Visto, similar to the Crime Watch program on Britain's BBC. Their intention at this stage was to spotlight the mystery of the surreptitious haircutting for the television program and to learn as much as they could about Restivo from the Italian police. In practically no time at all and much to everyone's surprise, the move to share information paid off. Women from several points in Italy Rome, Potenza, Turin, Milan, and other locales began calling in to report that someone had cut their hair too, 
under suspicious circumstances. Before the call stopped, more than a dozen women had reported losing hair to the mysterious hair cutter. Following several lines of specific, detailed, and continuing inquiry, the Dorset investigators were now more certain than ever that a hair fetish link existed in their case, one that reached across the English Channel to Europe and possibly as far away as the United States. They suspected that their killer harbored a compulsion to cut hair from women without their knowledge, perhaps while traveling on buses, and was similar to the evidence that had been developed in Bournemouth. Dorset detectives made plans to travel to Italy where they would interview the women who claimed to have had their hair cut surreptitiously. The detectives would also collect DNA samples from the women so that they could make comparisons with the evidence found at their own crime scene. They also wanted to learn as much as possible from their Italian counterparts about Restivo's connection with the young schoolgirl, particularly since it was beginning to appear that he may have been involved in multiple crimes across national borders. In the meantime, it seemed to the public at large that the investigation of Heather's murder languished, since there were still no charges made in her death. Nonetheless, Dorset investigators vowed to keep their investigation alive. Intuition told them that their efforts would eventually pay off. On the third week of March 2010, police in Potenza, Italy reported finding a mummified body in the attic of the city's Church of the Most Holy Trinity. Maintenance workers repairing a leaky roof found the human remains in a nearly inaccessible part of the attic, concealed behind a section of the wall that had been bricked up years earlier. It was a horrific discovery, eerily reminiscent of Edgar Allan Poe's fictional The Cask of Amontillado, in which the protagonist sealed his one-time friend in an alcove behind a brick wall. According to Potenza's chief of police, Romolo Panico, the desiccated body was in an advanced state of decomposition and would require DNA tests to identify the remains. When word of the macabre discovery became public, however, speculation almost immediately returned to the Elisa Claps case. Elisa's family reminded reporters that Elisa had gone to that particular church on the day she disappeared to meet with Danilo Restivo, then 21, for a date they had previously arranged. It was the last time anyone saw her live. Investigators also discovered that Restivo had gone to a local hospital for treatment of an injured hand a short time after his scheduled meeting with Elisa. He reportedly told medical personnel at that time, and later the police when they made their inquiries about her disappearance, that he had injured himself during a fall at a construction site. Restivo also told police that he had only spoken to Elisa briefly that day and denied knowing what had become of her. Restivo had been convicted of perjury when a panel of judges ruled that his explanation of his whereabouts on the day Elisa disappeared was not satisfactory. Sentenced to two and a half years in prison, of which he served little actual jail time, Restivo relocated to England shortly after his release. The remains recovered at the Church of the Most Holy Trinity were tentatively identified as those of Elisa Claps, based on the fact that the clothing, sandals, jewelry and sunglasses were identified by her family as belonging to her. Formal identification that the mummified body was Elisa's was confirmed a short time later through DNA tests. Police said that Elisa was likely already dead when her body was placed in the church loft. There had also been reports of women having locks of hair cut from their heads around the time Elisa was reported missing, but those reports had gone largely unnoticed until years later when they were uncovered during the recent investigation. As investigators probed deeper into Restivo's background, they learned that he may have been involved in the deaths, disappearances, or both of other young women, including 26-year-old South Korean student Jong Ok Shin. Shin, known as Oki to her family and friends, was found brutally stabbed at Malmesbury Park Road in Bournemouth during the early morning hours of July 12, 2002, a few months before Heather Barnett's murder. Shin later died from her injuries at a local hospital. Omar Benguet, 30, a resident of the Bournemouth suburb of Winton, was arrested and charged with Shin's murder a short time later. Benguit's first two trials ended in hung juries, reportedly because of testimony from unreliable witnesses. At his third trial, however, in January 2005, Benguit was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, despite his repeated protestations of innocence and the fact that Dorset police admitted that they have no motive for Shin's murder, no murder weapon and virtually no forensic evidence. Interestingly, the location where Shin was stabbed was within a couple of blocks of Restivo's residence, 
and there were reports that she may have had strands of hair in one of her hands when she was found. She was also reportedly a neighbor of Restivo. According to the Austrian Times, Benguet's lawyer, Giovanni Di Stefano, stated recently on Italian television that he believes Shin's murder is connected to that of Heather Barnett and Elisa Claps because of the purported strands of hair found in one of her hands. It should be noted that there was never any mention of hair found in Shin's hand in newspaper accounts covering Shin's murder, and it was not immediately clear where Benguet's lawyer had obtained that information. Nevertheless, Di Stefano said that he would be asking for an independent, formal investigation into his client's case because of a possible miscarriage of justice in light of the new developments surrounding Restivo. On Wednesday, May 19, 2010, in an early morning police raid on his home where he lived with his wife and two stepsons, Danilo Restivo was arrested and charged with the murder of Heather Barnett. His house was sealed so that Dorset police could examine it for possible forensic evidence. As he had in the past, Restivo denied any involvement in Heather Barnett's murder, and police remained tight-lipped regarding the particular evidence that led to his arrest, saying that it would all come out at trial. However, it was generally believed that the arrest was made because police had come to believe a significant link exists between Heather Barnett's death and the discovery of Elisa Claps's body in Italy. At 6.40 a.m. today, we arrested a 38-year-old man from Bournemouth in connection with Heather's murder. Detective Superintendent Mark Cooper said at a press conference following the arrest. He's currently at Poole Police Station, where he's being questioned by detectives on suspicion of murder. Meanwhile, Dorset Police reportedly searched Restivo's computer and found on its hard drive a picture of Erica Anserman, 27, who had disappeared from Cormayor, Italy on Easter Sunday, 2003. Restivo reportedly was also being investigated for the September 1992 disappearance of Cristina Golanucci a 21-year-old accounting clerk. According to the Milan Daily newspaper, Corriere della Sera, Golanucci's case is strikingly similar to that of Elisa Claps, in that Golanucci was last seen in front of a convent in Cecina at a time when Restivo may have been in Italy. However, at the present time, there's little evidence to connect him to Golanucci's disappearance. Restivo's defense attorney, Mario Marinelli, insisted that the claims being made against his client were pure fantasy and that everybody is rushing to libel my client as a serial killer, but he has absolutely nothing to do with all of this. He is quite calm. In 2008, new techniques revealed a bloodstained towel left at the murder scene had a DNA match for Restivo, but he claimed to have left it on the visit to the home of Barnett on the 6th of November. The evidence was still judged insufficient for prosecution. In a move that the prosecutor said was unrelated to the Italian investigation, it was decided that the evidence against Restivo was sufficient for a prosecution. When the body of Claps was discovered, it became clear that her friend had been telling the truth, and she later testified via a video link at Restivo's trial. Two months after the remains of Claps were found, Restivo was charged with the murder of Barnett. As the case drew international attention, women in the U.S. and Italy began to report to police cases where a perpetrator matching Restivo's description had secretly cut their hair either on a bus or in a cinema. It was ruled that the English court could hear evidence that Restivo had murdered Claps in Italy and about the similarities of that murder with the murder of Barnett. Italian investigators testified to the English court that DNA recovered from the clothes on the body of Claps matched Restivo and was consistent with blood. When in May 2011, Restivo was found guilty of murdering Heather Barnett, the judge sentenced him to spend the rest of his life in prison. Appealing against the whole life term, Restivo's lawyers argued the judge was wrong to take the Claps murder into account when sentencing Restivo for the murder of Barnett, as Restivo had not been convicted of it at that time. In November 2012, the Court of Appeal ruled in favor of Restivo and altered his minimum sentence to 40 years, but said it was highly improbable he would ever be released. In 2014, Restivo appealed against a decision he should be deported, the Home Secretary having ordered his transfer to Italy, where he would be jailed for life.